Hello, pharmacology student. Another chat with Brat. And the focus of this chat is going to be about drugs to treat angina. So let's think about our first client. And our first client is Mr. Jonas. And Mr. Jonas is 68 years old. He's got a history of hypertension. He also has a history of high serum lipids. He also has type 2 diabetes. And you can see from this picture, he's not feeling too well. He's having severe chest pain. And so he's got this, this pain across his chest. He's feeling diaphoretic. He's probably feeling lightheaded. And he is just um, uh, not feeling well. And again, he's got this really um, firm chest feeling, fullness, and it feels like someone's sitting on his chest. So what he has is he has angina. Angina is chest pain that results from ischemia. And some patients talk about that. It feels like there's just a squeezing. You can see this cute little diagram, the squeezing of, you know, like a vice around your chest. And it really is caused from a very physiological problem, which is this imbalance between oxygen supply and demand. So just think about that for a second. So go back to pathophys and just remember about what that, that is going on when you're talking about um, myocardial function. And so what happens with this is, again, the uh, angina is caused from this imbalance between supply and demand. So what happens is that the heart just doesn't have a good enough blood flow and not delivering enough oxygen to the heart, and so it results in ischemia. And ischemia, as you know, causes pain. So when you see all these things, what's going on here in this, the, all these different factors that can increase the need for the cardiac muscle tissue for oxygen supply, anytime the heart rate goes up, it's going to cause more demand because you need more, um, uh, heart's working harder, so it's gonna need more oxygen delivery, it's gonna need more blood flow to get the oxygen there. If you've got more blood volume, because then the heart's working harder and it's gotta be pumping that blood around. If the blood pressure is too high, it makes the heart work harder. And also if you've got the heart that's contracting really well or the heart is enlarging, for example, when you've got some cardiomyopathy, all these things are gonna make that heart work harder. So if it works harder, what you need to do then is you've gotta have better blood supply. So if those two aren't matched, you're gonna get angina. So what we do is we start patients on medications. So if patients have uh, angina, the medications are gonna be directly related to either increasing the supply or decreasing the demand. And that's really important. So think about that. The drugs that are going to decrease the chest pain are going to do one of those two things. So when you're talking about that drug therapy, they're going to do these two things. And the drugs that we're going to be talking about are some of the ones you've talked about, beta blockers. Um, we're particularly going to talk about metoprolol. We're also going to talk about nitroglycerin. Uh, and we're going to talk about a calcium channel blocker, which is called deltiazem. So basically, again, remember what's causing the angina. These drugs are going to reverse some of those processes and really help the heart to get a better oxygen supply. So we're gonna try and get more blood to the heart so it has the capacity to deliver more oxygen to the heart. And it's gonna do that by opening up blood vessels. And so it's gonna increase that supply of oxygen so that the heart has better um, delivery of oxygen and better function. We're also gonna do this um, we're also going to help the heart by improving that workload on the heart. heart. And so we're going to make it not have to work as hard. So if we get a better blood flow, we open up those, those blood vessels, and then we can do other things too to make the heart work less hard. That's like to treat hypertension. But these things are going to really help that patient to not have that chest pain. So one of the state, mainstay drugs that we can use, and this is used for just rapid treatment, is nitroglycerin. And nitroglycerin, as you can see, I have these little arrows here on this slide, is that it's used for the treatment of angina, either ongoing, uh, new onset of angina, or for prof prophylaxis. So, for example, if a patient uh, anticipates having chest pain, for example, having to go out and shovel snow, a uh, patient might take and the nitroglycerin before going out to shovel the snow. So basically what it does is you can see here where the arrows are, it relaxes those vascular smooth muscles. So as those muscles relax, they open up. As they open up, it's going to increase blood flow to the myocardium, and you're going to be having better oxygen delivery. You're going to have, again, that better balance between supply and demand. So the whole thing is, is basically work, decreasing that workload on the heart. So if you think about that action, if you look down to the bottom of this prototype, is that you're going to see that it can cause some other problems like hypotension, headaches, dizziness, 
that all comes from the fact that we're opening up blood vessels. In some respects, then we're decreasing blood pressure. So that, those are some of the side effects that occur related to uh, nitroglycerin that you need to be looking for. Another important thing on this prototype, which is you can find in your textbook, is that there's lots of routes. And that's a good thing because depending upon the, uh, the state of the patient, you might need to um, give the, the patient an IV. You might need to give it sublingually. Uh, again, if a patient is alert oriented, uh, what uh, type of route do you think that we're going to uh, administer or the patient will take on, a, on his or her own? It's going to be sublingual. So let's talk about that a little bit. So sublingual is just these little tiny pills that you can see. They typically are, are encased in some type of a container like you see here that is uh, a brown container because you want to protect it from light and also from heat. And one of the things is there are these little tiny pills. And what we want to do, these pills can dissolve rapidly as long as the mouth is moist. If the mouth is dry, there's not enough saliva to break down the, the little pill. So make certain you're uh, teaching the patient it's important to moisten the mouth, though it can start to um, break down and start to do its work. It goes underneath the tongue, and the reason why underneath the tongue is because we've got lost vasculature underneath our tongue that can rapidly absorb that nitroglycerin. You don't want to chew it or swallow it because you want that, that slow release to get immediately into the blood vessels in the mouth and then get into um, the bloodstream so it can get to the heart. Uh, some of the things the patients are going to talk about, they'll feel a kind of a fizzing, a kind of maybe a, even a, a tickling sensation in the mouth, and that just means that it's working. So a couple of things about administration, you need to teach this to the patient as well, is that with a sublingual administration, you need to give it when a patient's having an an, on an acute attack because the fact it is a very rapid breakdown because again, the vasculature in the mouth, it can absorb it very quickly and you give it at five minute intervals. And so you give a patient the, the nitro and it no relief, you repeat it again. Second time, no relief, you give it a third time. If there's no relief after three times, then you need to call the provider. If you're teaching the patient, the patient needs to call the provider and get to the emergency room immediately because for some reason it's not working and it can be in all likelihood that the patient's having myocardial infarction, which we don't want to have happen. So make certain that you teach the patient about that. If you're giving that uh, nitroglycerin to a patient uh, in another format for the transdermal, you want to make certain that it has good contact with the skin. So we can give that in a patch. So you put that patch on the skin and basically what we treat and talk to the patient about is that we like to give the patient some time off with nitroglycerin so that it, um, it can be continue to be effective. If we have it on all the time, the body gets used to it and develops some kind of a tolerance to that. So we usually talk about having some time off with nitroglycerin use. We can also give that the patient a uh, spray. And a spray, it's just in a, like, a little um, container, as you can see, a little aerosol container. Again, putting it underneath the, the, the tongue so it gets absorbed. We don't have a patient inhale it. We want it to go underneath the tongue again so it gets absorbed under those good blood vessels underneath the mouth, excuse me, underneath the tongue. So with the nitroglycerin patch, you can just see how we put this on. You put this on any um, area in the skin that, um, again, has close contact. So if you have a patient that has kind of a hairy chest, um, you want to put it on a place where there isn't. It can go on the chest. It can even go on the arm. Uh, just make certain it's got good contact. Be careful um, if you are applying this or the patient is applying it to not getting that medication on the hands because what it's going to do this drug is a vasodilator, so uh, patients can get very lightheaded. I had a student one time that got um, some of this on her hands, and I had to um, lay her down for a little bit. She got very lightheaded. So this is also a problem if you give it in the nitroglycerin ointment, because if you you know squirt that ointment onto a, a little measuring guy like this, you can get some of that again on your hand, and that's something you need to be careful of and tell the patient to not get that on the skin. So this is how you apply it, is you've got kind of this, this ribbon of medication, and the dosage is identified by the lines on that, that measuring guide. So another drug that we can use is a beta blocker. Now, beta blockers are very familiar to you because we talked about them in our neuro unit. And this is just the prototype of, of a beta blocker that you can find in your textbook. Now, again, what I encourage you to do when you make out your drug cards is connect the action 
to the side effects. So beta blockers are going to do the very similar types of things that nitro does, but in a different mechanism. So what the beta blockers do is that they basically, again, open up blood vessels. So as you open up blood vessels, you're going to promote uh, blood flow to the heart. And that's really important. So what it's going to do, it's going to basically slow down the heart and it's going to help it to uh, release, um, to not work as hard. And so again, you're going to kind of balance that supply versus demand. So beta blockers are good because they're, again, their whole um, action is to reduce the workload on the heart, again, matching that supply and demand. So with oral administration, um, it's going to take a little time to work. Um, but if patient's having some discomfort right away, this could be another um, drug that we could potentially use for a patient uh, to prevent angina, and it'll keep the patient more comfortable and less likely to have an anginal attack. But because the fact you're going to get all these beta blocking effects, so one of the things you're looking at as far as monitoring your adverse effects, because it's messing with the, the cardiac conduction system be, by blocking those beta adrenergic receptors, you can be watching cardiac rate and rhythm and monitoring blood pressure. So those are the important things to be thinking about when you're looking at your beta blockers. So our last drug in this category, are the, um, the, of this prototype, I should say, is the calcium channel blockers. And the particular prototype that we're looking at is deltiazem. And deltiazem is another drug that we can use in, in replacement of the, of the beta blocker or, um, or even nitroglycerin. We can have the patient on this drug you can see it's used for uh, to treat um, angina. If you know, it's also being used to treat high blood pressure. And the way that you treat high blood pressure is also can be effective to be uh, treating angina because again, it's helping to to um, open up those those um, those calcium channels, which then um, base, excuse me, I'm sorry, it inhibits those calcium calcium channels so that you basically they can't cause vasoconstriction, so they open up. And it's going to help then to increase blood flow um, to the coronary vessels. And again, it's getting better blood flow to those coronary vessels, getting blood flow to the heart muscle, and it's going to help the patient. It's also going to help by uh, dilating the arteries. It's going to block those calcium channels in the, the vasculature and the peripheral vasculature so that we can open up those blood vessels so the heart doesn't have to work as hard as it's pushing blood out of the heart and into the periphery. So those are uh, some uh, good actions of calcium channel blockers. So when you're studying these, they work very similarly as beta blockers. So kind of group those together as you're studying. And when you think about them, think about them as you take a look at what are the side effects that are here, be very similar to the beta blockers and that they're causing, um, because of the decreasing the blood pressure, you're gonna have to monitor blood pressure and be careful when the patient changes positions, getting up from a sitting position to a standing position. So um, that basically um, concludes those uh, drugs to treat patients with asthma. Or excuse me, asthma. That was our last, um, our last unit, is patients with coronary artery disease and patients with angina. Some other things that you want to be teaching them is that they should decrease alcohol intake because that's going to be um, putting them in a better health state. Of course, stopping smoking, optimum weight, getting physically active, controlling diabetes, healthy diet, all these things should go along with teaching the patients about their drugs that are helping them to, to treat their angina. So that's our chat with Brat. You have a great rest of the week. Bye-bye.